Welcome back, Daniel here again with the Virtual Robotics Studio. This is gonna be our second video in the XRP series. We are ready to finally dump new programs onto this robot and get it moving. So we're gonna start our autonomous programs here in just a second, but before we do, as always, special thanks to the Argosy Foundation. All right, let's get started with our first program for the XRP. So first thing we have to do is we have to open up WPI Live. So if you watch the videos back to back, you probably don't need to do this step. But if you haven't done it uh, on your computer, find that 2024 WPI Live VS Code uh, shortcut and run that. And if you haven't done anything else in uh, WPI Live since the last video, your program will still be open. Uh, if your program is not open, just so you can see how to do this, you do File, choose Open Folder uh, right here, and then just navigate to that folder. So mine was on the desktop, XRP Programs, and the program I made in the last video was called XRP Test. So I'm gonna go into that folder and choose Select Folder. And now we're right back to where we were. If I click here, you can see we've got all of our files, and this robot.java is exactly the same as we left it in the last video. All right. So the first thing we're gonna do is we have to get rid of a few things here that are extra that we do not want uh, in our program. So on the side under Java, right? So SRC, if yours is all closed up, SRC, Java, we have main robot and XRP drivetrain. We're actually gonna click on XRP drivetrain and we're gonna delete it. So you can either press delete, I think or backspace, you can right click and choose delete if you prefer. Whatever, whatever method you want, it's gonna ask, you know, you can restore this. Are you sure you want to delete it? Yeah, move it to the recycling bin. And you will note that things just changed colors over here on the side. They turned red. Uh, I'm in dark mode theme. Um, you might be in the light mode theme, so your colors might be a little bit different, but the idea would be the same, is we have these things showing up as errors. And it says right now that there are three errors in robot.java, and that's because we just deleted that file and that file was being used, but we're gonna replace it with other stuff. So we'll still start at the top, but as we move down through the code this time, there will be a few lines where we're gonna have to say, hey, that was the line that we have to delete from earlier. All right, so first thing, imports. We talked about the imports up here at the top. We're gonna go underneath the last import um, couple things about Java programming. It is case sensitive. So if it's a capital letter, you have to type a capital letter. Um, most lines are going to need to end with a semicolon. So you can see those here. That's kind of like our way of telling the computer or the robot that that is the end of that command. Um, so keep an eye out for that. But spaces generally don't matter. So this line that's import edu dot whatever, if it looked like this, it would ignore the spaces when it goes to run the program. So you'll see me sometimes adding extra spaces because I think it's easier for you to see what's going on. Um, and the same thing with extra lines. So I'm gonna actually add a space here so I'm not up against the other imports. I have one blank line. And the idea in my head is just the things I'm importing are gonna be down below. Um, another thing you can do to help keep your code organized is you can make comments. So as you see, all this green writing that's here, Anything that's in green, that is a comment, which means it is not something that the robot is gonna look at. Those are only notes for humans. So we can read it, we can understand what's there, but the robot will ignore it. So for example, I could do a two forward slashes to create my own comment. And then I could type um, the, you know, my added imports are below. So now as we add them, we know these three were in kind of when we started, and now these are the ones we're gonna have to add. You don't have to do that. Um, there will be points where adding these comments will really help you. This is one where it's kind of nice to do it, but it's not, you know, not critical. All right, so let's do our first import. All of these lines of code that we're gonna be typing here are gonna be roughly the same. And they're all gonna look basically like the lines of code that are above them. So they're all gonna start with import. And you'll notice as I start typing import, I do im, and this box pops up that says import. That is the autocomplete. It's trying to like guess based on what we type, what it thinks we're, what command it thinks we're trying to type in. And I really, really strongly encourage you to use the autocomplete. So at this point, I can click on this or I can press tab on the keyboard and it will finish typing that word for me. The reason why autocomplete is so powerful is it's always gonna get the case sens sensitivity right. If there's capitals, it's gonna put them there. Um, and it's never gonna mistype something. There will never be a typo. So by using that autocomplete, you should have less errors later. 
Um, so I strongly recommend doing it. Okay, so after we type in import, you can see right now we have this red squiggly line underneath it. That means there is an error in this line of code which makes sense because we haven't finished the line of code yet. So if you see those red squiggly lines while you're typing the line of code, don't worry about it. If you think you've finished the line of code and that red squiggly line is still there, then you need to go back and you need to double check and see what might be wrong. All right, import. And all of the things are gonna be the same. So this edu.wpi.first.wpilive.j is basically all of the different things that you can import that you can use in Java programs, like they all exist in the same universe. So even things that are not related to our robot. So if we tried to import something that was just called motor, there's a good chance that there's a motor for the XRP robot. There's, mo there's like eight different motors for the first robot. There are motors for robots that have nothing to do with first robotics. And we need some way to differentiate them. That's why this long line of code is there. So we basically just copy this every time. All of the things we're going to be working with or importing are always going to start edu dot wpi dot first. And remember, you can hit tab every time it shows up. Dot, if I do wp, there we go, wpi live j dot. And now, after we did those four things, we're now ready to add our specific thing that we're trying to add. And we're gonna just add motors. That's our first step, is to turn a motor on, get a motor driving. So we need to do an XRP dot XRP motor. And you can see this is capital X, capital R, capital P, capital M, but I'm gonna tab and it's gonna fix it for me. So even if I type lowercase, it still finds it in the autocomplete, I can still tab to, to get the correct code. Okay, now, this is a little bit different. This is one of the small differences between this robot and the first robot. Here, because we are using the specific XRP robot uh, and XRP motor, we're adding .xrp, .xrp motor. For the first robot, if you're using like the uh, rev speed controllers or you're using the cross the road speed controllers, then you'll do .rev or .ctre, dot, and then you'll add the type of controller it is. So Spark Max or Talon or Talon FX or whatever. And those are just names of the different motors and speed controllers that you'll see uh, for FRC. So that's slightly different, but the format is the same and it works the same when we use it later. Okay, next uh, thing we're gonna do is we actually don't have any more imports to add. The only thing we want for this code is the motor. So now we're gonna start scrolling down and in public class robot extends timed robot, right? The around line 26, remember I might have added a few extra lines or you might have deleted some lines so it won't be exactly the same necessarily but somewhere around here we're looking for private final XRP drivetrain. We've got the red squigglies. This is one of the lines of code that no longer works because we deleted that other file. So I'd like you to highlight this whole line of code and delete it. It's nice though too because this is exactly where we wanna be to add our next bit of code. So like I said, after we import, import says now we have the ability to use XRP motors. Down here, we actually have to say, hey, on our robot, there is an XRP motor. It is plugged in here and it is gonna have this name. And that's what this line of code is gonna do. So we're gonna do private. Private, if you uh, are familiar with programming, means that it is only usable within this class, within this area of the program. So if we had other parts of the program off in other places, it would not be able to see this. So you can do private sometimes to keep things separate or to, to kind of reuse things. If we said public, it would be usable everywhere. You don't really need to worry too much about that. Everything we're gonna do is just gonna be private. So type private. The next thing that we're gonna type is the word final. Okay, final basically means it's not gonna change. So where the motor is plugged into the robot is not going to change the entire time we're running the robot. And so by making it final, the program knows that, okay, this is unchanging. It can run a little bit faster, spend a little bit less programming resource or, or processor resources dealing with it. It's not a big deal. You probably don't have to put that, uh, put the final in. It probably works either way, but it is best for us to put it. So we're going to do that. Okay, so private final. And now we are actually going to say, what are we creating? We are creating an XRP motor. So XRP motor, remember that's got all the capitals, so I'm gonna autocomplete it. It should change colors to, you know, nicely if you do it right. You can see if I type it wrong, um, sometimes, well, sometimes it will not change colors, but I guess in this case it is, okay. So XRP motor. And the next thing we do after a space is what is the name of the motor? Well, we have two motors on our drive. We've got the left side and we've got the right side. So I'm gonna call this one left drive. And we're gonna say it is equal to 
a new, because we're creating a new object here, and it is a new XRP motor. In this case, it already knows what I want before I type anything. Um, so if you do the tab right away, here, it's going to add the parentheses for you. This is just a quirk of, uh, of VS Code here. If you type XRPM and then hit tab, it's not going to give you the parentheses. So if you did it that way, you're going to have to do Shift-9, uh, right? Open parentheses, the, the regular parentheses. Inside of here, so this line of code is saying, OK, we're, we're doing an XRP motor. It's going to be called left drive. It's a brand new thing, and this is where it's plugged in. So the number we put inside here is where it's plugged in. And on that XRP site, on the WPI Live document site, uh, one of those links under XRP had a list of all the hardware and where it was plugged in. So I looked at that. I know the left drive motor is going to be plugged into zero on here. So inside these parentheses, I'm going to type the, words, uh, the number zero. Uh, and you can see I've still got a little bit of a red squiggly here at the end of my line of code. If you see something right at the end of your line of code, the first thing to think about is, did I put a semicolon? And that fixed the error. Now, we got yellow squigglies here, which is new. Uh, I think we actually we had them up here on our motor, but it's not yellow squigglies anymore. The yellow squiggly is basically is the program telling us, you created this thing, but it's never actually used. So we never actually drive the motor. So it's saying, hey, are you sure you need this in your program? So yellow squigglies, you can ignore them. You can run your program. It works fine with those. Uh, but if you finish your whole program and they're still there, you probably can also delete them and just clean up your program a little bit. OK, so we have left motor. You know what? While we're here, let's go ahead and make right motor too. So it's going to be the exact same line of code. You could probably copy and paste the whole thing, but I'll go ahead and retype it. XRP motor, the only difference is it's going to be right drive instead of left drive. And these names, left drive and right drive, you can name them whatever you want. You could name it left drive. You could, you could have called it Bob and Shirley. That, that would be fine, except I strongly recommend you pick a name that makes sense and is descriptive of the thing it is so that if you come back to the code in a few months. You're like, I don't know what the heck I was thinking with these names. I don't know what this is. If it's descriptive, you'll always be able to know. And if you have more than one person working on the program, they're not going to know your silly names. So silly names can be fun, but descriptive names are always going to be better. All right, let's finish this line out. So we have left drive, and the second one is right drive. We still need a new. It's going to be, again, an XRP motor. This time, I'm just going to hit tab so I get the parentheses for me. This one is going to be number one. Another thing that you can see happening here is it is adding this device num colon. I'm not typing that. In fact, if I type that, so if I delete the one, if I type that device num uh, colon one and I put my semicolon, this is an error. You can see that it's in white text now because I typed it. If it's in gray, this is just a label that it's adding to try to describe what's happening inside here. So if you see this sort of gray stuff with the colon, that's a label that the program is adding, not what I'm typing. You do not need to type it. So if I delete that, actually when I click, oh, well, now it thinks there's an error. Um, so that you know, happens sometimes. I think there is actually no error here. So that is another thing that can happen. Sometimes you type, and if you change some stuff, it sees it as an error, and it forgets that it's not an error. Sometimes you can go back um, and type the code out again. And you can see I typed the exact same thing, but now it doesn't think that there's an error, except just on the last little bit here. Um, I think this is a bug, and I think when we run our code, that's going to disappear. So I'm going to ignore that for now. OK. Um, Cool. The other thing you can think about is when we do these parentheses, that basically means it's asking for you to put a parameter in there. You've got to type something inside some of the time, but not all of the time. Uh, if you hover over the thing here, um, so XRP motor, that is kind of the function that we're calling or the method that we're calling, uh, inside XRP motor, if I hover on it, we get this little bit of text that says, you know, this is the edu.w, that's, what we're, that's the, the thing we're calling. And inside the parentheses, it's asking for device num, which is also the label that it's putting here. And again, that's just where it's plugged in on the robot. We can use that hovering over, though, to find out what other things want um, later. OK, so we're going to say this is good. I think that's going to go away when we run our code and it builds it. We'll come back to that in a little bit. So now we're going to scroll down all the way. 
So past robot init, past robot periodic, past, well, not past autonomous init. Let's go to autonomous init. We've got another red squiggly line here. So this M drivetrain dot reset encoders line. So you should be around line 65 inside public void autonomous init. So we need to find that line of code, highlight it, and delete it because that was um, another one of the errors from that file we deleted earlier. Okay, and then we're almost done. There's kind of nothing below it. The next bit down we want to go to is autonomous periodic because this is where we put our auto mode. And inside autonomous periodic, we actually have two different auto mode, places for two different auto modes. We have the default auto mode here and we have a custom auto mode here. The default auto mode runs if you don't select anything. There's a little selector that we can use that lets us pick through auto modes and we can actually add more than just the two. When you're doing your FRC robot, one of the things to think about is you might need to have an auto mode that starts on one side of the field, starts on the other side of the field, starts in the center of the field. Maybe you have one that delays a little bit so your partners can get out of your way before you move. You don't want to have to go back to your program, like uncomment code or change your code around and redeploy it every time before a match. This way, you can have all of your different auto modes listed in, and there's just a little, uh, we call it a dashboard. On our dashboard, you just do a little drop down menu and pick the one you want for that match. So it's a lot faster, it's a lot safer that way. Every time you're downloading code, when you're rushing out to a match, it's scary because maybe something goes wrong and then your robot doesn't work at all. So that's what is set up here. We're going to start in K default auto, though, because this is going to run if we don't do anything else. And we just want to get like the first step. If we can get something moving, then you know everything is working, everything is set up correctly, and we can go from there. And we want to minimize the variables in place to get that one thing moving. So where it says put default auto code here, that's a comment. You can delete that. You can go to the line below it, whatever you want. Um, but the way this works is in public void autonomous periodic, right? we have this open curly brace. And then all the way down here, we have this close curly brace. So everything inside those two curly brackets is part of autonomous periodic. Then we have this switch. This is choosing which auto mode do we want to run. We have an open curly brace and a closed curly brace. So these are where our different possible auto modes are listed. Then each individual auto mode is in between. So in this case, we have case default auto. It is the default case. So in between the, the colon and the break is where we put our code. So this is a little bit different. I don't know why it's set up to not also use the curly braces to tell you where the start and end is, but that would be from the colon, from our case colon to our break is where the code goes, or our case, and in this case, the default is added to the break. So we're going to be in between the default and the break. That's where our code needs to be typed. And we want to turn on a motor. The way you control a motor is you type the name of the object that we created for that motor, which was left drive. Let's start with left drive. And then you do a dot. And you can see in this menu now, these are all the things that we can tell our left drive to do. We can disable it. We could check if it's equals to something or make it equals to something. We can get the value that it's doing. We can see if it's inverted. We have all these choices. But the one that we want right now is just dot set. set. And inside the parentheses, it's going to say double speed. So that's the one we're going to pick. And you'll notice when I autocomplete this time, it put k default period, which has nothing to do with anything we're doing. Sometimes uh, VS Code guesses what you want and guesses completely wrong. Drop the ball here. We do not want that. Instead, what we need to do is we need to put a number in here. And the way to think about it is this. Okay, so we have our robot. If we send zero power to the motor, it doesn't move. So zero means don't move, means stop. If we send one, to the motor, that means spin as fast as you can forward. If we give it a negative one, if we say, hey, go negative one speed, that is spin as fast as it possibly can backwards. Okay, then we can use decimals in between. So if we want to go half speed forward, that would be 0.5. We want to go one third speed reverse, that would be 0 0.3333333. You get the idea. All right, so let's do that. Now we're ready to add something to our code here. Left drive dot set. Instead of k default period, we're just putting a number. I'm going to put like, I don't know, point, uh, whoop, we got to make sure k default period is gone. So if it's highlighted, you can just type over it. Mine wasn't, I guess. I'm going to do point, uh, let's do point six. So you don't want to choose too small a number for this test. If you choose point one or point two, it might not be enough power to make the wheels move. Uh, you could just go all the way to one. I usually like to, to stick to the middle powers, but. 
anything kind of between 0.5 and 1 should work well for this test. All right, and guess what? Um, we are done. That is all of our code. If you are unlucky like me, it still says there's one error. If I scroll back up, that error was here, which I'm saying is not an error. I think it's just a bug. If yours says no errors, then you're for sure good. OK, next step, we need to turn on our robot. So XRP robot. Once again, if you find the power cord here, where the power plugs in, the servo also plugs in next to it, kind of in between the servo and power, we have that little tiny switch on the side. So I'm going to reach down, and I'm going to flip that to the on position. You should get some red lights here. Uh, you also notice the green light is blinking here. One of the things that it's doing when it's booting up is it is sort of um, initializing the gyro and getting all the things settled. So best practice for turning this robot on is to leave it flat on the table, turn it on, and don't touch it until that green flashing stops. If you're not using the gyro, though, it doesn't really matter. OK, so we're on. We're powered up. Now we can connect to our robot again. So on your computer, we have to connect to the robot's wireless network. So I'm going to go down to my Wi-Fi down here. Uh, and I'm connected to the internet right now, but I'm going to go ahead and change that from the internet to find your XRP dash whatever it is. Okay, And once again, you can connect. If you've already connected to this robot before, it remembers the password. If not, remember the password is XRP dash. WPI Live, all lowercase letters. Uh, and this is going to take, it's, it's a little slow to connect, but we're going to give it, we're going to give it some time here. And I think actually, before it says it's done connecting here, it's good to, it's good to go. It's doing things like checking to see if the internet is there. Um, but just to be safe, we're going to wait until this uh, comes through as connected. All right, there we go. And remember, no internet secured is what we want to see. Obviously, there's no internet because we're connected to the robot, not the internet. And once you get that, we can go back to our code window here and click on the W up in the top right-hand corner. And when we're ready to run code, so on the FRC robot, we would do build um, and deploy. On this robot, we're going to use simulate robot code. That is our uh, basically connect to the robot and run this, this code that we've written. So choose simulate robot code. Then down here on the bottom, it's going to run through some stuff. And if you get an error down here, and I will, I'll induce an error in a minute to show you what that looks like. Um, but if you don't get an error, uh, you'll get that success. You'll get a thing that pops up that's like, hey, Windows firewall, you might get this or not. I'm just going to allow access. I don't, I'm connected to the robot. I know it's safe. I don't need the firewall to do anything. And this window should pop up. Also, before we look at that, you'll note that error that was here, that mysterious phantom red squiggle, is gone because it was not actually an error. It was a bug. So that might happen to you sometimes. One of the things you can do in your debugging process is to just run the code, simulate it, see if there's an error, see if it works. It will at least clean up the squigglies if there are any bugs. All right. So now we've got this window. This is our simulation window. We can also think of it like our dashboard. This dashboard will look a little different on the FRC robot, but it's kind of the same idea. What we care about right now is in the top left-hand corner, we have this robot uh, status. It's disabled right now, but I can turn it into autonomous mode, teleoperated mode, or test mode. We can also see this is like how long the thing has been running, FPGA time. So it's been one minute since I turned the robot on now. Um, down here is where we will get joysticks. When we go to teleoperated mode and we want to connect something to it, that's going to show up here. We can see connected joysticks down here. We have nothing connected right now. Um, network tables, we're not really sending too much stuff, but you can kind of go through here and see. We could have auto choices, and you can see what choices are in the auto mode. We'll come back and talk more about that when we put something in our other auto mode. We can see the devices that are connected to the robot over here. We have left motor and right motor. Right now, they're going at zero speed, which is what we'd expect. We don't want it to be moving when the robot's disabled. Um, and down here, this FMS, this is sort of like stuff to mimic the FRC robot. So when you connect to FMS, that is the field management system. Um, so that is like you connect to a computer at the field when you play with your FRC robot. Um, you can choose what alliance position you're in. There's three v three, three red robots and three blue robots. Most of this stuff, you know, even for your FRC robot, you're not going to mess with. Okay, let's test our code or our code here. So what I'm going to do is my robot is going to, if everything works correctly, when I click on this autonomous block here, 
the left wheel on my robot should turn on, and it should never stop. Since my robot right now is on top of a table, and I do not want it to drive off the table and crash into the floor and potentially break itself, I'm actually going to lift my robot up and just hang on to it. I'm looking at this is the left side wheel here, so I'm looking at this wheel uh, starting to move. And if that wheel starts to move, again, this is the front of the robot, this is the back. So if this wheel starts moving, uh, and it should move in this direction because that's forward, then you know, I'll probably put it down on the table and let it spin around a little bit, but I want to see what it's going to do first. So I'm going to go back to my robot simulation window here. I'm going to click on this autonomous button, and I've got the wheel spinning. So that is what we want to see. And I think it's, I'm going to be ready to catch it, but I think it should just kind of go in circles here, and it should stay on the table. All right, and that was our whole program because we turned the motor on and that was it. We never turn it off. So it will do this until it runs out of batteries or we stop it. So if your robot is doing this, then good job, you nailed the first step. So let's go ahead and stop it on that ro robot simulation window. We're gonna click back on the disabled tab. That should stop the robot from moving. Now this, I cannot stress this enough. This is probably the most likely thing to cause you problems. You have to. You have to have to close the robot simulation window now. Don't minimize it. We have to get rid of this entire window. If you minimize it, when we go to simulate again, a new window is going to pop up, and they kind of fight with each other, and your robot will stop working. So make sure you hit the X here. Every time we're done and going back to the code, make sure you close this so we can get a new one later. OK. Now. Let's scroll back down. I came up here to check this out, but let's go back down to where our autonomous was. Autonomous periodic. So we have this one spot here where we turned our left drive motor on. Let's test our right motor now. Um, actually, really quickly, before we test our right motor, I'm going to do one thing. Like, let's say I didn't have this semicolon here. Now when I go ahead and choose simulate robot code, that should give me an error on the bottom, so I can kind of show you what that looks like. So build failed in three seconds, so we have an error. I'm going to make this bottom window a little bit bigger. And if you scroll up in this window, it should give us some information for what the error is. So if I scroll kind of all the way up to the top, here's my first error. So we could not compile it. It failed. And then it kind of tells us why. So this is the file, robot.java. The colon is saying it's at line 78. And the error in this case, it actually is really helpful because it says it expected a semicolon to be there. And it's actually showing an error where it expected the semicolon to be. So if I look at line 78 in my program, that is exactly where we deleted the semicolon. So let's put the semicolon there. Let's do a slightly different error. What if we didn't type the set right? What if we mistyped and we hit like the Y here instead? Let's go ahead and run that and let's take a look at what that error looks like. OK, it's running, it's running. Build failed. Once again, I'm going to scroll up. And here's the problem. Now it says, still line 78, error, cannot find symbol. So that's basically saying, hey, if it can't find the symbol or it doesn't know what, what this thing is, it means you probably messed up your typing. And also, when we look at the line, we can see where the red squiggly is. I can see that, oh, that was supposed to be set, not S-E-Y. So we'll go back to set, and now everything should work. I will go ahead and simulate one more time just to make sure we got all of our errors out. So that's kind of the, the pattern to troubleshoot, is when you get an error, look at this bottom terminal window, scroll up to the top. It'll at least give you the line numbers where to start looking. Sometimes the error might be that there was a problem on the line above it. So make sure you kind of check the lines above and below just to make sure that it's not hiding uh, anywhere. All right, and it ran. I got my simulation window back up, so we know we got our errors out and everything is good. I'm going to go ahead and close that with the X, right? Always close it. Do not minimize it. And now we'll come back into our autonomous periodic. Let me, uh, whoop, let me shrink this down a little bit so we can see more of the code. And in autonomous periodic, we are going to add our right motor. Another thing that you might see here is when you kind of click on this line, depending on where you click, the cursor ends up in all kinds of weird places. And I could start typing my code here. Um, the tabs, you can kind of see things are tabbed out. The idea is, remember 
This autonomous periodic is everything in between this open curly brace and this closed one. And the idea is they're on the same line here. They're tabbed in the same amount. Then everything inside of that gets tabbed in one more. And then we have our switch, which has the open and close. So everything inside the switch then gets tabbed one more over. Then we had our default case here, and you saw I tabbed my left drive over inside of that. So the idea with the tabs is it actually doesn't matter. I could, I could put this back here and run the code, and the code would run fine. But it's a little bit easier visually to like break down what's happening in your code, to debug it, and for other people to come in and see what's going on if you have these tabs in the right spot. So you know, kind of try to keep it neat the way, that, the way that I'm describing. But if you don't, don't worry. It's not the end of the world. So we're ready. I'm going to tab over so I'm lined up with where my left drive was. And now we're going to do right drive. Again, I'll, I'll tab complete that dot. And it's the same line of code, right? So we're just going to set tab. And again, it does not want k default period. That was a mistake. We want to set a speed. Speed value has to be between negative 1 and 1. I want my robot to drive straight forward, though. That's my goal right now, drive straight forward. So instead of uh, k default period, I'm going to put the same value, 0.6, as I used for my left drive. So if the left drive is moving at 0.6 speed, or 60% power, and the right drive is moving at 0.6, we should drive straight forward, right? Let's find out. So we added all the code we need here. Let's go to the W and choose Simulate. And you're going to find this is a lot of programming is making small changes in the code and then simulating it to test or running it on your main robot to test it. And then coming back, making small changes, going back and running it again. All right, my simulation window is up. In this case, I'm going to turn the robot so it's driving towards me if it goes forward so I can catch it. I don't want it to drive off the table. And on my robot simulation window now, I am ready to switch from disabled to autonomous. And let's see what the robot does. Oh, wait, what? Hmm. That definitely is not driving forward. The good news is, though, if I lift it up, the left motor, let me turn it so, well, I guess this way it's for you correct. The left motor is still spinning. The right motor is now spinning. So that means we did turn the right motor on. It's just going the wrong direction. Hmm. So let's go ahead and stop this. Let's hit disabled on our robot simulation window. And I'll go ahead and actually just close this down. And if we look at the robot, we can kind of understand what's happening. The left wheel was working perfectly. Forward and backwards was correct. But the motor is mounted pointing this way. So if the motor's mounted pointing this way and spinning around, if we take that motor and we flip it to the other side and have it spinning the same way, now all of a sudden it's spinning backwards. So because we have two motors and they're on opposite sides, in order to make this go forward, the left motor has to go forward and the right motor has to actually go backwards. So in the code, we could make a quick change to solve that problem. We could just say, hey, OK, so fine. Every time I put a negative for the right drive motor. You also notice if you put a negative, it doesn't put the speed label. Remember, the gray is the label it adds for us. I did not type that. For some reason, when it's a negative value, it doesn't have that. Don't worry about it. It's fine. This, I could do this. You could simulate this. You could run it. It would work. The robot would drive straight forward. But it's kind of weird to have code that doesn't do what you expect. So if, if you just picked this up and you looked at it, you would expect 0.6 and 0.6 to drive forward. You would expect 0.6 and negative 0.6 right, to make the robot spin. So we could go through and do this and just remember that, oh yeah, we have to add these negatives because this motor is backwards. But a cleaner, smarter way to do that is to just invert the motor. So in the code, instead of adding this negative sign here, I'm going to delete that. We're going to scroll back up to robot. Oh, let's do it in robot init. So find robot init. Remember, robot init runs one time when we first turn the robot on. And what we can do is we can say the right motor should always be backwards. Remember, if we want to do something with the right motor, we have to type the name of the thing we want to do something with, which is right drive in this case. And then you do a dot. And if you remember, I was talking about inverted before. Well, we can choose set inverted here on the menu. And set inverted, if it gave you the parentheses, great. If it didn't, you're going to have to do open parentheses here. And you can see the little pop-up is telling me set inverted. Boolean is inverted. OK, a Boolean is, that just is a fancy way of saying it's true or false. So if we say false, it doesn't invert the motor. It leaves it alone. If we say true, it inverts the motor. That's what we want. So we're going to type the word true inside here. 
and it added the label is inverted colon. I did not do that. And we've got the little squiggly because we are forgetting the semicolon at the end of the line. What this line does is basically multiplies all the values of the right drive by negative one. So if we were sending it a one, one times negative one, now it's sending it a negative one. It's inverting the values. Positive 0.5 becomes negative 0.5. So now if we go back down uh, to look at our autonomous part, autonomous periodic, we still have 0.6 and 0.6, but now it should drive forward because we inverted that right motor. So let's do that. Let's hit the W. Let's choose simulate robot code. Let that run. We should get our pop up. Meanwhile, I'm going to position my robot again so that it should drive forward towards me. I'll give myself a little bit of a chance to catch it if it does something unexpected. Uh, so it's going to drive hopefully this way across the table to me. And now we're ready in our window here, robot simulation window. We'll hit that autonomous mode button and driving forward. Still never turns off, which is a problem. All right, let's hit disabled. <laughs> Stop that robot from driving forward. Um, we are ready now to make a couple changes. We're going to go back through and we're going to change from controlling each motor separately to controlling them both as part of a drivetrain. This is going to help make our auto mode look a little cleaner. Uh, instead of having two lines where we set the left drive and the right drive, it'll all be on one line. And it will give us some good options and make our teleoperated mode faster. Also, we need to find some way to determine how long the robot should be driving. So if we want it to drive from you know, here to here, we have to know how long that is and then be able to tell it turn off after that happens. So in the code, let's see. Make sure you close your robot simulation window. Mine is still open. I'm going to hit that X. Go back to the code. Let's go all the way to the top of our program. We're going to start brand new up here at the top. And we're going to do a new import here. So we're going to do two things at once. Like I said, we're going to create that drivetrain so that we can program all of our motors in the drivetrain together. We're also going to add a timer so that we can control how you know, long, how fast, or how, or how long, thus how far the robot should drive forward. OK, so we have to do two more imports. The first import is going to be import. And it's always, I mean, like you probably could just take this section here, copy it, and just let that always live on your clipboard because we're typing that every time we import something. All right, dot. And in this case, we are going to do a drive. So dot drive, dot. And the first one is differential drive. That's what we want. So differential drive just basically refers to any drivetrain in which the way you turn is by running your wheels at different rates or different directions. So there's a difference. So to turn right on this robot, if we go forward on both, the robot goes forward. If we go backwards on both, the robot goes backwards. And then if we go forward on one and backwards on the other, as we saw, that is what makes it, um, that is what makes it rotate. OK, so that's just why it's called a differential drive. All right, so we got differential drive. It's still squiggly yellow because we haven't used it yet. That's fine. We're going to use it in a minute. The other thing we want to get here is our timer so we can control how long things should drive for. So we're going to do another import, edu.wpi.first.wpilibj. And in this case, we're going to do timer. Choose timer. Should be a capital T. And the timer is just a stopwatch. We can use the stopwatch. We'll start the stopwatch at the beginning of auto mode and say, hey, drive forward for one second and then stop. OK. I think that's all of the imports that we need. So let's scroll down to the next section in our code here. That is this public class extends timed robot. This is where we actually are creating some things that we can, that we can directly control. So actually, this is going to be another drivetrain thing. So I'll leave the, that, this one right next to the other ones. We're going to do another private final. And this time, we're creating a new differential drive. That was the thing that we added up before. So you can do differential drive. And now we get to name it. And I, this is just the drive on our robot. So you, know, you could call it like M drive for my drive. You could just call it, you could probably just call it drive. All right, and that is going to equal a new differential drive. Differential drive. And then we have to add some stuff in the parentheses uh, of our differential drive here. And what it's asking for, we can see on this pop-up, is what is the left motor? So motor controller of the left motor. 
and then the motor controller of your right motor, because our differential drive has a left side and a right side to it. And our left motor, we called left drive. Then we'll do a comma. And our right motor, we called right drive. And this line of code is still not happy because we still need our semicolon at the end. So now we've created a whole drive object that we can use to, to simplify our code a bit. And the other thing that we created up there was the timer. So let's go ahead and make a timer object that we can use later as well. So we'll do private, final, uh, that is going to be a capital T timer. This one, like, you can't really autocomplete because you gotta, gotta get past timed robot. Uh, we're gonna name the timer, I'll just call it M timer because my timer, I don't, I don't know, doesn't have a specific name. If you have multiple timers, you could have an auto mode timer and a, you know, a like uh, timer for how long you want to move your arm or whatever. So you could have a bunch of different timers, but we're just going to use the one. So M timer equals new timer semicolon. And we don't have to do anything in here. It's just a new timer. We can reference it by talking to M timer. All right. I think that is everything we have to do here. Let's move down in our code to autonomous init. So not robot init, but autonomous init. Okay, and we're going to be in between, in between the curly braces here. I'm going to leave myself a space so I know the stuff I'm adding is a little bit lower down. And we have to do a couple of different things here. This is all timer related stuff. Um, and so the thing we need to do here is uh, let's do M timer so that we can control the timer. And we actually have to start the timer. So we're going to do M timer dot start. And it should be at zero, but just so we're extra sure our stopwatch starts at zero, we're going to do M timer dot reset. And remember, this happens one time at the very start of auto mode. So this is going to run. Auto, we, we click that auto mode button. This is going to reset our timer. And then our robot is going to start driving forward. So now that stopwatch is basically at zero the moment our robot starts driving forward. So we can use that stopwatch to control how long we want to drive for. So let's go back to our auto mode here. We're going to go down now to autonomous periodic. And um, what we're going to do is down here in the default auto, we are going to go ahead and comment out these two lines of code that we put here. So I'm going to put two slashes in front of them. So this was how we control our robot's drivetrain when we want to do it one at a time. We're going to replace that now with an identical line of code. And that identical line of code is going to start with the name of our drivetrain. So mdrive dot. And we have a lot of different choices here um, for how we can control this. And that's the, one of the reasons why going to this drivetrain object is so powerful, is there are other things we can use uh, as you get more advanced. But we're going to start simple. We're going to do a tank drive. So you can start typing tank drive. There's two tank drives. I don't know what the difference is. Um, they look the same. I'm going to pick the first one, because surely that's the, that's the better one. I think it doesn't matter which one you pick. And inside tank drive, it's saying, OK, we need left speed, we need right speed, and then we have this Boolean for square inputs. So there might be times when you're controlling your robot that you don't want a linear curve to control your speed. So if we don't square the inputs, then you know, 0 is here, 1 is up here somewhere, and 0.5 is halfway in between, and we get a straight line between the speeds. Sometimes you will get better control, smoother acceleration if you, instead of going in a straight line from here to here, you use a square of the value. So it would curve up like this in this shape. We're not going to do that. Um, sometimes you can't even tell the difference, but that is an option that is built into this. So you can experiment with that on your own and decide if you like it better or not. So all these things need to go away. We don't want any of those things. Those were all wrong guesses by VS Code for what should go inside here. We know it needs to be what power do we want to send to the left motor, which was 0.6, comma. What power do we want to send to the right motor, which was 0.6, because we're driving straight forward. And then if we did another comma, that would be true or false to square the inputs or don't square the inputs. If you don't put anything, it just doesn't do it. So we can just ignore that. 
All right, and it added my little labels so I can see left speed is 0.6, right speed is 0.6. So this should make our robot drive straight forward. This code right now, this one line right here, is exactly equivalent to these two lines. They do the exact same thing, they just do it a little bit differently. And you can see, if you had a long auto mode where we had line after line after line of code, it might be nicer to have one line to look at instead of two. It kind of shrinks our code up a little bit. Okay, but we have our second problem, which is we do not want the robot to drive forward forever. <laughs> I would like for it to, I mean, maybe we'll start here and we'll try to drive just before it crashes into my computer. So that looks like, I don't know, we could get a tape measure, but I'll say that's probably about 20 inches. We're looking to drive forward about 20 inches here. Um, and as you're running your robot, either be very vigilant if you're gonna do it on the table, that you're ready to always catch it, or just go ahead and put it on the floor. Um, and you can do tape marks. So I actually um, will grab some tape at some point here, and I'll put some marks for where I'm trying to start and where I'm trying to drive to. Okay, but that's our goal. But we need to figure out how long it's gonna take to drive that far. So in the code, we're gonna have to add some checks for how long to drive. So we're gonna do if, and then open parentheses. So this is the way that you make decisions in, uh, in the code. Okay, we start with if, and then the thing we wanna check. So what we're gonna check is that timer, M timer. And remember, M timer is zero when this starts running, because we do it in autonomous init right here. We, we reset it and we start it, start it and reset it. So it's at zero when we first start. And if we check to see if it's less than a number, right? Like if, it's, if the stopwatch is less, if I look at the stopwatch and it's less than, let's say one second, then let's drive forward. Once it's more than one second, we wanna stop driving forward. So that's what we're gonna do. M timer is less than one. Then after the closed parentheses, we actually have to add the open curly brace. So that is, if you are not familiar, next to the P. Shift the button next to the P. All right, and then we'll hit enter. In between these two curly braces is where we want to drive forward. Now, unfortunately, that's wrong because we want this to be inside of it. So you could cut and paste this in, or we could delete that bottom curly brace that it made automatically for us and put it below our tank drive. And also, this gets tabbed over so we can see it's inside that if really nice and clearly. Okay, so this will now, oh, I made a mistake. M timer, you can see it's still red squigglies here. And the reason is because M timer is the object, but not the value on the stopwatch of that object. We actually have to do a dot here. So M timer dot. And to read the stopwatch, we have to choose M timer dot get, the very top one there. And that is the actual number value. Okay, so we get the value from our stopwatch. If it's less than one, we drive forward. If it's not less than one, the robot should stop moving. Like when we get to the end of our auto mode, no matter what, we wanna stop moving. So if it's less than one, we do this. The next bit that we can type is else. And else just gets the open curly brace. So if it's less than one second, we run this code. Otherwise, else, we run whatever we put here. And what we wanna put here is turn the robot off. So m drive dot tank drive and off is zero for the left motor. Remember, all these things are not really what we want in here. Comma, zero for the right motor. And it will add those labels for you, left speed and right speed. So now it should drive forward for one second and then stop. All right, let's go ahead and click the W. We're gonna choose simulate robot code. It's gonna build. Remember, if you get an error, go ahead and scroll up, try to find where that error is, see what the differences are. But I got build successful and there is my robot simulation window. Okay, I'm gonna set my robot up so it's gonna drive forward towards the middle of my table here. And remember, I'm aiming for 20 inches. Let me actually grab my tape here and I'm gonna put a mark where I want it to start. This is actually one of the most important things. I cannot stress this enough. I cannot stress this enough. Your robot, when you're doing autonomous mode, both for the XRP robot and the FRC robot, must start in exactly the same place, pointing exactly the same direction every time. If you're sloppy with it, if you come over to your robot and you're like, eh, that's, that's pretty good. 
And then the next time it's just a little bit turned or a little bit turned this way or it's a little bit further forward. Guess what? If I start here and here, the end position is going to change. Angles are really important too because if I'm driving straight, that's great. But if it's turned a little bit, I'm not going to end up here. I'm going to end up all the way over here. So small differences in how you start your robot can have big impacts on how it finishes, especially as you start driving longer and longer distances. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a piece of tape even with the front of my robot here. And I'll know that I'm just going to always start right kind of next to that tape. And then my goal was to go forward about 20 inches. So you know what? Actually, I changed my mind. I think this is going to be better if I put it, we're going to put it right here in the middle like this. So I'm going to start with the, for me, the circuit board of the ultrasonic sensor of these eyes in the front are going to be right on the back edge of my tape. And I'm trying to go until they are right on this edge of this tape. Okay. So let's run what we've got and see how well we did at guessing. So uh, on our robot simulation tab, I'm going to hit autonomous here and then our robot should take off. Okay, that probably, probably was a little short. <laughs> so we want to make it all the way out to here. Uh, we started here, we ended about here. So I would say I'm maybe 40% of the way there. So let's go back and let's change how far we're driving here. So in the code, we are going to close that robot simulation window. So hit the X to shut that down. We're back in our code here. And we can change how far the robot drives in two ways. We could change the speed, right? Obviously, if I make this full power, if I change it to one, it's going to drive faster, so it should move farther. That's not the best way to do it, because changing this, like if I could double this, I can't, but let's say if I made this 50% more, if I went from 0.6 to 0.9, the robot would not necessarily go 50% farther. This is, it's not a good correlation between speed and how far it traveled. Once you get towards the top end, there are less differences. At the bottom end, there are sometimes big differences. So this is not a good way to change it. What I suggest is find a speed that you're comfortable with, lock the speed in, and don't change it. So in this case, 0.6 and 0.6 is good. Again, those middle speeds are good. You'll be more accurate and more repeatable when you're not kind of pushing it to the limit. So if you go all the way up to one speed uh, or 100% power, it'll be a little bit less repeatable um, because you're kind of right at the, the edge of what the robot can do. So, I'll leave my speed alone. Instead, the only thing I need to change is how long we drive forward for. So this one here, we're driving forward as long as less than one second have elapsed. Well, I said we need to go about two and a half times as far. So let's change that one to a 2.5. So instead of driving forward for one second, we're not going to drive forward for two and a half seconds. All right. Click the W. Let us simulate robot code. And while it's simulating and running, it's a good time, you know, you can go over and make sure your robot's lined up at the starting point, you're ready to go. Mine is lined up, so I'm about to hit this autonomous mode and we'll see, hopefully we get closer to this second blue line here. Oh, not bad, not bad. We're a little tiny bit short. Um, so I'm here, I want it to be here. But that, you can see how I was estimating how far it went and it looked like it was about, you know, 40%. So. We did that quick multiplication. Now we just have a teeny bit left to go. So back in the code, we're going to make another change, right? We are going to change that 2.5 to, let's try 2.7. And there's really no, like, you know, you kind of watch how far the robot drives and you kind of make a guess here. There's no guaranteed way to hit the number. So as you get more experience, you'll be able to kind of get it in less guesses, but expect it to take a few tries. All right, so we'll simulate that robot code again. Get our window to pop up. Meanwhile, I'm going to line it up, make sure I'm starting in the same place, pointing the same direction. <clears throat> and I am ready, so I'm going to hit that autonomous button, and let's see what happens. Oh, that's pretty good. I am just a hair, just the teeniest bit past the edge of the line. That's good enough for me. If you're still off, right, back to the code. Close your, uh, close your window, um, get back to the code, and you know maybe you want to do 0 0.65, 67, or 65. Maybe it's just a little tiny bit too far. So play with that number until you get there. Um, I would say that after the second decimal, you're kind of wasting your time. So 
five is probably a little bit different than 2.7, but 2.65, one, four, three, I mean like those decimals don't do anything. Like you can put them there, it's not gonna hurt anything, but just like after two decimals, same thing with robot power down here, like 0 0.6 and 0 0.65 will be different. 0 0.65 and 0 0.651 pretty much gonna be the same thing. You won't notice that. So two decimals is about how far we wanna go in most of these things. Okay, so I have my drive straight. It is now dialed into the right distance. That's great. Let's take a look back at the robot then. Let's do a slightly more advanced auto mode. So if the robot starts over here on this blue line, our first step of the auto mode was to drive here. Okay. Sometimes there are things in the way um, on the field, so you have to drive around them. Let's, let's say our auto mode is this. We're going to start here. We're going to drive forward. Once we get to this position, we're going to try to do a turn like this. Eh, let's do the turn this way. And then I'm going to want to back up. And I don't want to fall off the table, so we want to back up to, I don't know, some point around here. So this is the goal. I want to get the back of my robot kind of lined up right there. Now, what I'm doing is just inventing something. And by putting the marks down, you don't have to use tape. Tape is really good. You could put a bottle here. I could put, you know, whatever, my mouse here and say drive until I'm touching the mouse or the tape roll over here. You can mark stuff out however you want, but it's worth it to mark the stuff out because there is a tendency to change your code. And then when the robot is kind of off, you're like, okay, that was my new target. If you don't have something concretely there to say drive this far exactly, and you're just kind of like drive somewhere around here, you'll never get that actual fine tune dialing it in that you need to practice. So having the marks is really good. Um, and our goal here with this pattern is just we'll drive forward. We're going to make a turn so we can see how turning in auto mode works. And then we'll back up just so we can see how backing up works. So that gives us kind of the three major um, ways to move the robot around. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at how do we add more steps in our auto mode to make things work. We have, kind of down here, our first step. And I'm going to start labeling these now. I like to label them after the um, curly brace here, but you can label it however you want. Uh, so do the double slash. And I guess technically you don't have to label it at all. But what I'm going to do is say this is our uh, drive forward. And if you measure your distance, you could do a longer distance or a shorter distance. But you know, this, I said, was about, about 20 inches. Um, I think my, my span is, is a little over 9. So this is you know, 18, 19, maybe 20 inches. So we'll say this is our drive forward uh, 20 inches. And you could have you know, 3 feet for yours. You could do 1 foot for yours, whatever you have space for. But by labeling it here, when I go back and have a bunch of these cases, I can really quickly look back and see, OK, oh, that's what that step was doing. That was the drive forward. That was the turn. Or that was the backup. And you can put it here. Some people like to put it here instead. Um, and if your screen is wide enough, uh, some people like to put it here. So it's right on the line that is actually doing the movement. But I find putting it here is a little bit nice because it's this whole thing is the drive forward period. Um, and it keeps the screen a little bit more compact, so I can see a little bit more that way. All right, then, and in fact, I'm going to do, this is step one for our thing, okay? Down here on the bottom, this else case, this is always step end, the last one. We always do this at the end. We turn the motors off at the end, okay? So we need to add stuff, but we need to add it in between step one and, and the end, the last step. So if I go after the curly brace for this if up here, the close curly brace and hit enter, we can add another case. So instead of just doing if this is true, run this code, otherwise run this code, we can now do another check. We can say, hey, if this is true, do it. If not, check this next thing. And that is called an else if. You type else if and then open your parentheses. And remember, we get all these errors. It's, we're, we're not done with our line of code. Don't worry about the errors yet. And the else if is going to be kind of the same thing. We're going to do m timer dot get. We're going to read our timer. And if that is less than, I don't know, we're going to turn here. So again, I don't know how long it's going to take to turn. We're going to completely guess. I want to turn for one second. But I can't just put a one here. Because 
If you remember, we are looking at a stopwatch. Stopwatch starts auto mode at zero. By the time we're done driving forward, the stopwatch is reading 2.65 or whatever your value is, which means if I want this next case, if I want to turn for one second, I don't just put a one here. I have to add it to where we left off. So we finish this first bit driving forward at 2.65 seconds for the next one second, which means from 2.65 seconds to 3.65 seconds we want to turn. So you're always adding that number. That is one downside here is that if you make changes in the middle, you have to go and change everything afterwards uh, to, to uh, compensate for that. OK, then we're going to do the open curly brace and hit Enter. And I'll do a note here as well. So this is step two. And this is turn, turn 90 degrees. Uh, and we're going to turn to the right so that the back is facing me and I can back up. And I want to just have it facing me so I can catch it if I go too far. Otherwise, choose whatever direction you want. All right, and how do we turn? So I'm going to go inside here. I'm going to kind of tab over to the right spot. We start with our drivetrain object. So we start typing that, M drive dot. We're using tank drive control right now, so we choose tank drive. Tank drive just lets us put direct values to the motors. And then, remember, all this was a mistake. We just need to give it a left power and a right power. If we look at the robot, we can kind of visualize quickly which direction it should go. So if I want it to turn this way, right, that means the right motor needs to go backwards and the left motor needs to go forwards. If I wanted to turn the other way, then the right motor would go forward and the left motor would go backwards. So we know right is backwards. Kind of the direction you're turning is always the negative direction. OK, so back into the code, mdrive.tank drive. It means we want our left speed to stay positive. I'm going to stick with, you know, I don't know, point, point 0.7. We'll turn a little bit faster. Just so you can see, you can use different speeds. Um, and then I'll do a comma. And the right motor has to be backwards. So that is going to be negative 0.7. OK, so now it should run this first step, which is drive forward 20 inches. Then for one second after that, from 2.65 to 3.65 seconds on the stopwatch, we should turn positive on one, negative on the other. And after that is done turning for one second, we are going to turn the motors off. Looks good to me. Let's simulate again, simulate robot code. Make sure my robot is lined up correctly at the starting point here. And I am waiting for my control window here to pop up, my robot simulation window. There it is. All right, so I'm going to hit that auto mode, and we're going to see what happened. What should happen is the robot should drive here and then turn. Hopefully it turns the right amount, but I don't expect it to. All right. Distance forward is good. That turned almost two times as far as I wanted it to, right? It started here, it ended just a little short of 180. And I want to be here, which means, of course, we're going back to our code. And we are going to edit that number. So close the simulation window. So this one second was a little over twice as long as it needed to be. So instead of one second, I'm going to add, so half would take me to 315, but that was a little bit too much. So let's try 3.0. And yes, I could just type three. You don't technically need the, the point zero. All right, that's it. Let's uh, simulate and do it again. Waiting for the window. There it is. All right, so we are set up. Let's run it. My distance is good. My turn. OK, it was a little short that time. So we've learned something. And what we've learned is the turning rate is not perfectly linear, right? If it was, we would have been pretty close to perfect with the changes we made. So we need to turn a little bit longer. And that makes sense, right? It's going to take a little bit of time to get it accelerated up and start moving. And turns are pretty short. So that difference at the beginning where it's sort of accelerating up can have a big impact. So 3.0 didn't work. I'm going to go, let's go 3.1 and see what happens. Let's try 3.1. All right, simulate robot code. Make sure my robot is lined up on the starting point. And ready for autonomous. All right, robot set. Let's go. Oh, we're just a little short again. All right. 
So one more change. And let's see, 3.1, should it, should it have been 3.15 all along? Uh, I think, let's try 3.2. And again, I'm just guessing and checking, right? Like, we'll find out. Is that the right number? I don't know. I've been wrong three times already. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see what happens, but I am running the simulation. Okay, we're ready. Robot's lined up, so I'm going to hit auto mode here. And let's see what we get. Yeah, okay, all right, cool. So it was probably exactly the number I said maybe it was at the beginning. So three point, let's do 3.15 and leave it at that. Okay, I could test this. You probably should test this. I'm gonna move on to the next step. So we'll build and we'll kind of test it as we go. Now, you can see the way we've been doing this is do one step, dial that in, add the next step, dial that in, add the next step, dial that in. As you get more comfortable, it is okay to throw two or three steps in at once and maybe try to, try to tune those in at the same time. But as you change previous steps, the next steps are gonna be affected by that. So you gotta kinda like spend more time visualizing, well, what was just that particular step doing? Um, so it's a little bit harder without experience to know how to make changes in two different places at once. But in this case, if we have to adjust our turn a little bit more, we can do that um, and we can see it start to back up. Our backup distance might be affected slightly, but um, that should be okay. All right, so let's add our next step. And this is the way this works. Every time we wanna add a step, we just go underneath the last one, the last else if, or if there is no else if, the if. Hit enter. So we're always above the else is where we're gonna add our new steps. And we're gonna do another else if. And I don't, between the else if and the, and the thing, you can have a space there or not, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And we're gonna do mtimer.get, right? So we'll read the value of our timer, and if that's less than, how long do you think we need to back up here? Um, we're gonna back up a little bit slower. So, uh, you know, let's try five seconds. So from 3.15 to five, that means we're gonna back up for 1.85 seconds. All right, let's get our open curly brace and hit enter. And again, I could copy this code or we can type it again. It's gonna be mdrive.tank drive. And I'm gonna go a little bit slower. We're gonna go backwards, so that means negative 0.5 for the left motor. And we wanna go straight backwards, so get rid of all that extra junk, negative 0.5 for the right motor. So we'll go a little bit slower, just so you can see the effects of, of slightly different speeds. All right. And after five seconds, we still move on to turning everything off. That looks good. Let us simulate. Okay, and while that is running, let's make sure we're lined up in the right spot. Looks good. And now, before, the lines kind of mattered, but now this direction matters as well, right? Because we're trying to line up here. So I'm going to go right to the corner of my tape is going to be my official starting point. And we're ready. Let's hit that auto mode and see what happens. All right, so far so good. Turn is good. The backup is short, about half the distance. But that turn looked good, so I don't think I need to change the turn. So once again, back to the code, and we'll just kind of guess this one. So five, let's just make it, um, let's make it like 6.1. All right, and simulate that code. Oh. We should also add the label here. We'll go ahead and add that after we test it. Okay, we're ready. Check the robot's alignment. Looks good. And go. All right, let's, let's pretend I said line up on the back of the tape. No, that's pretty close. I went a little bit too far. Obviously, we can make some changes, but you can see both the differences in speed, how we change speeds, and, and that changes the way the robot behaves. Uh, a couple things to think about here is if your robot, when you're over here and you're driving across, if your robot is always not driving straight, mine's driving pretty straight, which is, which is not always the case. If it's curving off this way, what can you do about that? Well, instead of saying drive forward with 0.6 and 0.6, this side, the side that it's curving to, this motor is going a little bit too slowly. It's a little bit too weak. So instead of 0.6 and 0.6, what if you tried 0.6 and 0.65? You should be able to dial that in so it goes relatively straight. 
Another thing to think about is the battery will affect this. That is the one major downside of doing a time-based auto mode is we're driving forward for an amount of time at 50% power, 60% power, whatever you set it to. If your batteries are full, 60% power of full batteries is gonna go farther than 60% power on dead batteries. Now for your FRC robot, this isn't that big of a deal because autonomous mode is the first 15 seconds of the match and you should be fully charging your battery before you go out to every match. So for that first 15 seconds, the battery voltage is always gonna be up at the top. But on this robot, as you use it more and more, the batteries will eventually get weaker. So if you find that what used to work is now going a little bit too short everywhere, it might just be that your batteries are low. You could try swapping those or you know just don't worry about it. Okay, so that was all of our puzzles. Let's, um, let's talk about what we wanna do next. So there's one more step to this autonomous mode. A lot of times uh, in FRC, you might have to drive somewhere and then you often get to start with a game piece in the robot. So if you drive somewhere and then drop that game piece off, that could score you a bunch of points in auto mode. So now our robot is starting here, it's driving, it's turning, it's backing up. And let's say there's something here where either we start it on our little servo or, um, we, let me disable my robot here so I can move the servo by, up. Oh, I can't move the servo. Okay, if you feel your servo and it's fighting you, don't force it. If it's powered, it's trying to hold position and this guy's the servo. But anyway, let's pretend like there was something back here and we wanna either knock it off, hit it to get points, or if you're holding something, tipping it back, maybe it rolls off. We're not actually gonna do anything with it, but the idea is to visualize that you had something. Maybe this was a gripper and you tip back and you open the gripper to drop something off. So. What we wanna do now is when we start auto mode, we're gonna to wanna to move our servo to a position that's inside the robot, drive through the whole thing, and the last step when we're here, we wanna make that servo go down and then maybe back up. All right, so that means we now need to add the servo into our code and update our program to add that last step of move the arm after we're in position. Okay, let's jump into the code. I think I forgot one thing here, which is let's add our comment here, this last step, right? This was back up to the, I don't know, we'll call it the quote goal, because that's what we're trying to get. Okay, and this code is all good. Remember that 6.1 was a little bit too far, so I could switch that maybe to 6.05 and make one little, small change here. All right, let's go all the way back to the top of the code, all the way back up to the top where we got our imports. We're about to import something else. And we're gonna import edu.wpi.first.wpi.lovej. And in this case, it is gonna be another XRP specific thing. So go ahead and do .xrp. Dot, and we are looking for XRP uh, servo. Oop. Oop, hold on. I think I might have gotten that one wrong. No, that should be right. XRP dot, there it is, XRP servo. Sometimes if it doesn't show up when you're typing the things, sometimes I delete it and I kind of retype or re-autocomplete the previous, in front of the previous period, uh, and then it, it comes up. And I'm not really sure if that's me or that's a little bit buggy in the program, but that is my technique for getting around it. All right, so now we've, in, we've <clears throat> included our ability to use servos. That's what the import does. We need to scroll down to this uh, public class robot extends timed robot. This is where we set up the specific motors, specific drivetrain, specific timer, and specific servo that we're gonna use. So we need to do a private, final, this is gonna be an XRP servo this time. And we can name it, this is, I mean, we only have one servo, so you could do my M servo. Uh, I'm gonna call this the back servo, because it's on the back of the robot. That's a little bit more descriptive, and the way I would tend to name stuff on that FRC robot when you have multiple stuff. Maybe you have two servos, maybe you have another arm somewhere. Um, and that equals a new XRP servo. And we need the parentheses here. And it is asking for the device num. And if you look on the board of the XRP, right? Like if we're looking over here on the, on the actual board, we can see that the servo is plugged into what is called servo one, like it's labeled on there. Here's the thing, servo one is actually port four. 
And that is on the WPI Live document page on the XRP getting started. If you go through that, it has that whole list there. So servo one is actually port four. So we'll put a four inside here and uh, throw a semicolon up. So now our back servo is something that we can program. We can talk to it. We can use it. Let's scroll down to, uh, you know what? Let's just go right back to autonomous periodic. Okay, and in the first step of autonomous periodic, guess what? We're going to do more than one thing here, okay? We are going to also, so we're driving forward for 20 inches. We're also going to make sure the servo is set at a good starting position inside the robot. And to control something, right, we start with its name, which is, in this case, back servo dot. And servos are a little bit different than motors. So we learn motors. For a motor, if you send a motor zero, it turns it off. If you send it one, it's full speed forward. If you send it negative one, it's full speed, all that, right? Servos are a little bit different. Servos, we tell it what position to go to. And it holds that position. It goes there on its own, and it holds that position. So for a servo, if we send it zero, that means go all the way in one direction. If we send it one, that means rotate as far as it can rotate in the other direction. And any decimal will give it a position somewhere in between. So 0.5 would be like halfway in between. And this servo does about 180 degrees of motion. It's probably going to be a little bit less. So let's go ahead and do back servo dot. Uh, we're going to set this time position. And this is that number between 0 and 1. I don't know which way inside the robot is and which way outside of the robot is. And that's going to be the case a lot of the time when you're programming stuff. So guess what? Let's just guess. Let's, uh, let's say. Let's say outside of the robot is zero, and then one would tuck it all the way inside the robot. So let's try one. Let's send it a one. Let's see what happens. That could be completely backwards. I don't know. We're about to find out. Okay, so in this first step, it's going to set the servo into a position. Then the servo is smart enough to hold its position, so we don't have to do anything in any of the other steps. It just holds that position. So let's try it. Uh, we are going to simulate robot code. And in this case, I'm going to just actually bring the robot over closer to me, and I'm just going to hold it up in the air, because I don't need to watch it drive. I'm just going to watch what the servo does, and then uh, make some adjustments from there. So we are ready. My simulation window is up. So I'm just going to hit autonomous here. And you can see the wheels are driving, but the servo went to this position. So that is the one position on the servo, which, good, I guessed right. It's tucked in. Um, zero then will be extended out to somewhere, you know, rotated around this way. So that's perfect. We guessed right for once, and we don't have to make any changes to that first step. So back to the code. We're going to close our robot simulation window. And let's see. So drive forward 20 inches. We could also be like, and stow the servo inside. Okay. Then we drive out, we turn, we back up to the goal. And actually, after we're backed up to the goal is when we need to do our next step. So we actually need to make a new case here. So go above the else. We're going to do another else if. And we don't know how long the servo needs to move. But we'll, you know, we'll do m timer dot get. And we'll say if it's less than, now here's the thing. For FRC, you get 15 seconds for auto mode. Our auto mode right now is done at 6.05 seconds in, or plus or minus, depending on if you're driving farther or not. So I could go ahead and time the servo and see how much time it takes to move. It moves pretty fast, so probably one second is enough. But there's no reason for me to push it. This is the end of our auto mode. Is we're parked here, and we move the servo arm back, and auto mode is done. So you know, I'm just going to give it extra time. So instead of adding one second, I'm going to add two seconds. And remember, if I want this to be for two seconds, I have to go to the previous number right here, 6.05. Add two to that, so we'll be at 8.05. That'll give me two seconds for the servo to move. And then the end of this line, we add our curly braces. Now, what should happen here is we should move the servo, right? So let's do back dot or back servo dot set position. And if zero is tucked all the way in, zero will be folded out and hitting whatever we want to hit or dropping off our game piece. And we're not done. Because the last thing we told our drive to do was back up. 
If we don't stop the drive here, then for the two seconds when that servo is moving, it's gonna keep backing up. So we also need to do M drive, and actually I'm going to uh, put this on top, just because every step it's been drive then servo, and I'll keep it consistent. You don't have to, it could go in either order and it would work fine. M drive dot tank drive, and we are gonna go zero comma, get rid of all this stuff, zero. So we're actually turning it off here, and then we leave this else case here, which just keeps everything turned off. Now, there's one more thing we can do in the else case, which is after we move the arm back and drop the stuff off, the next thing that's gonna happen in FRC is you're gonna wait for auto mode to end and then start driving the robot. There's a good chance you don't want this servo hanging out where like you can crash it into stuff. So in this last case, to get ready for auto mode or get ready for teleoperated mode, driver control mode, let's tuck the servo back in. So that's just the line of code at the beginning here. It is literally just this servo.set position one. We're gonna drop that in our else case and this will be uh, back servo dot set position one. And we are good. This should be it. This should be our complete auto mode. All right, I'm going to simulate robot code. I'm gonna line up my thing here. And I guess what we're gonna do in this case is, you know, I'll just, my robot, I'll have my hand here. My robot should give me a high five, kind of. That'll be the goal. All right, so I am up on the simulation window. I'm ready to hit autonomous mode, so let, uh, let's run it and see what happens. Okay, so it stowed the servo nicely. We did our drive, we're driving forward, and now does it high five me, yep. And then it tucks it back in after two seconds. You can see that delay from when it went out to when it went back in, it was a really long delay, right? That's because we chose two seconds, and two seconds was way, way overkill. So you could probably make that one second. You could tighten this up. If you have a very complicated auto mode where you're getting close to that 15 seconds, then you gotta go back through and say, okay, how much time do I really need for some of these waiting steps? Um, you can also see my robot did drift a little bit to the side, so I could go back through and tune uh, the backup values, maybe give a little bit more power to the right motor to keep it straight. But that was basically it. And the goal is, let's look at the code one more time and talk our way through it. The goal is for you to understand that this is your first case, and then you can add as many more cases as you want with else ifs. And you are just always adding to the amount of time that was there. And you could have 20 cases here. You could keep adding stuff. Uh, we didn't label this one, but this was uh, move the servo out. Right, so we could have more cases. After you move the servo out, we could have another case that moves the servo in. Then we could have the robot drive forward. We could have it turn the other way, and we could have it back up and park where it started. So you have these options to just keep expanding this. As long as you understand that we start with an if, and that's our first check. We end with this else where we turn everything off or put everything in our stowed position, so we're ready for driver control. So I guess it's not always the stowed position, but the position you want it to be in when your driver takes over. And then you add as many else ifs as you need to do all the steps. So you're basically taking this area here, you can copy it, you can paste it, and you have another step in your auto mode. And you can just do that for every step you need. That's the key, is understanding that process, you'll be able to create an auto mode where the robot moves anywhere it wants. Now, we're gonna do one more thing in our auto mode video before we call it good, and that is I did tell you there are ways to put other auto modes here. So we have this uh, K custom auto in our code. We're gonna add just a tiny bit of code here just so we know that things are working. All right, so um, let's do in K custom auto just so we know it's working. I'm gonna make the simplest auto mode ever. Remember before we did just the drive motor, let's just move the servo. So we're gonna do back servo dot set position. Uh, and our servo starts kind of in the middle, so let's put it at one. Let's fold it up. Doesn't really matter what we choose here. We just want something to move to show you that K custom auto is being run. Okay, and let's simulate. And the robot's not gonna move, so I can just leave it sitting there. Only thing that's gonna move is the servo should fold up. All right, and we're taking a minute here, there we go. All right, there's my simulation window. Now, in order to get the stuff that you need to choose, there are some of these other menus on the top, and I'm not 100% sure which one it is, but I think go to network tables, smart dashboard, auto choices, and you see it pops this extra pull down menu up. 
And this is kind of like what you'll see on the FRC dashboard. It looks a little different, but you hit this pull down and we have choices. Default auto, which we've been running, choose my auto, which should just move the servo, right? So let's go ahead and hit autonomous and there goes the servo, but it didn't drive, didn't do anything else, which means we know it was running our other auto mode. So we can go back to our simulation here. Let's go ahead and switch it to default auto really quickly and I'll put it back over at the starting point and then let's run that one, disabled and enabled. And now we are doing the full drive turn back up and move the servo and fold the servo up. So we now have on our uh, robot simulation window, the ability to choose between two different auto modes. I'll show you how to add more, but we're not gonna actually add the code for that right now. So if you go back to the code, let's scroll all the way up to the top and then scroll down a little bit. So this uh, smart dashboard uh, and sendable chooser, those are the things that let us do this. So that's, they were already in, so we didn't have to add them on our own. As you scroll down, we have right here in extends robot, we have default auto, which is K default auto. And we have my auto, which is called K custom auto. Guess what? If you made another line here, you could copy this and paste it and just change these two things. You could change K custom auto to, this is my uh, drive an L and move the servo auto. And you can label it whatever you want. The label here, the quotes is what shows up on the, the picker when we do that pull down menu and the K custom auto or default auto is the name that it's referred to in the program so we can, we can select through it. So you can make as many as you want there. Um, and then there's one more place I believe down here in robot init where we create this chooser which is that pull down menu. We add the option for default auto or we set the default option to default auto. Then we add the option for custom auto. Well, if you're gonna have more, you just add another line of code underneath here with your new name. So just make sure the quotes and the name here match whatever you added up above. And now you have three cases and you can have four cases, you can have five cases, you can add as many as you want. All right, that is all we're looking at for today. So. Congratulations on successfully doing a fairly complicated autonomous program for your robot. That uh, is a great job by all. All right, so we're gonna come back in the next video. We're gonna finally get the game pad out so you can start driving the robot yourself and have direct control of it in our teleoperated mode. Um, but before we go, as always, I'm gonna give a special thanks to Argosy Foundation.